Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on why real why is real world evidence important in wound care and how can it be used in clinical practice. Tonight, we've got some interesting insights into evidence based practice and examples for you all to relate to your own practice. So I hope you all enjoy. If there's any questions, please put them in the Q&A box on your screen or device. And when our speakers are done, we can answer all your questions. Our first speaker is Chris Borge. Chris is a lecturer, university lecturer at Glasgow Caledonian University within the School of Health Sciences. Um, he teaches across the nursing programs um, and also at master's and doctorate level. He's got a clinical background in, in adult nursing, mostly critical care and in clinical governance and quality improvement. And he is going to kick us off with his talk um, about evidence. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, thank you for the introduction, Catherine, and thank you for inviting me along to this webinar. Um, as you've heard, my name is Chris Borge and I am a lecturer in nursing at Glasgow Caledonia University. Um, this short talk will have a discussion around evidence-based practice and in particular it will focus around um, real world evidence. So the example that I'm going to use when I'm, I'm speaking to you and you'll see that a bit later on is around case studies. And I'd also like to um, look at the context of where they fit in within the range of evidence that we have available um, um, to support our practice. Um, Please note that this topic has been condensed into um, a, a bite-sized overview. Um, a number of the, the themes and topics within here um, are taught over sometimes a couple of hours, sometimes days, and indeed sometimes entire modules um, at various levels within university education. So it is a bite-sized introduction, um, but hopefully um, that will give you some food for thought um, to start reading around um, and, and looking beyond um, some of those topics um, independently. So, when you're going on holiday, does your browser look a little bit like this? Mine certainly does. Really busy. Um, I've got every single page open, every single flight page open, every hotel page, every single review page, scrolling through the results. So, if your answer to this is yes, then we're already really singing from the hymn, same hymn sheet from the outset, really. Because what I'm doing here is, before I book my holiday, spend my hard-earned cash on a nice holiday, I've looked at the numerical data. So I've looked at the price of the flights. What value can I get there? What's the best class of flight that I can get for that, that money that I'm going to spend? What's the quickest way to get there? So a lot of numerical data. I'm also going to look at some, um, <clears throat> some qualitative data. So in particular around things such as how clean was the hotel? What did people think of the hotel? What are some reviews of the flights, et cetera? What things are around the hotel? Looking at that big picture before I make that individual decision. So really, I've researched around making the best decision for me to have the best holiday at the best price um, and have the best time available. So. If that is you as well, um, and it's not just around holidays, it's around lots of things, buying cars, um, <clears throat> buying anything new, buying a new washing machine, then actually you're really on a good road towards being able to um, find research, appraise research, um, and also find the, vet, the best available ed evidence to provide the best available care to your patients. The first thing that we've got to understand here then is evidence-based practice. We've looked at it in a sort of day-to-day um, -day experience of something within our life, but actually when we look at it in the context of healthcare um, and the care that we provide in, in the context of today, wound care, um, we've got to be able to think about it from a more evidenced and um, we've got to look at some literature to support what we're saying. So what does the literature say? So. This is a quote that I quite like explaining evidence-based practice because I think it encompasses a lot of elements. The important things to me here are around this collection and, and interpretation of data, and we'll cover a wee bit of that later. Um, the fact that we're talking about things that are patient reported, um, clinically observed, um, and research focused. These are all really important, but actually at the core of all that within this definition, we also talk about the quality of clinical judgment and producing those outcomes for our patients because we all want the best possible outcomes for our patients. So let's break evidence-based practice down a little bit more. So um, 
evidence-based practice is an amalgamation of research evidence. So what I like here is, in this diagram, um, is it talks about the best available research evidence. And we'll unpick that a little bit later on in this talk. And that it doesn't just say research evidence, it talks about the best available, and there's a good reason for that. Um, there's obviously patient preference and values. So we then take that into context. Um, our patients would sort of be secondary to what we're doing, but we know that they have to be the heart of everything that we do. Clinical experience and expertise. We know that there's not always evidence for things through the COVID pandemic. Quite often, we were actually just phoning around and there was sharing of information where clinical experience and expertise was what we were working on on a day-to-day -day basis. However, for evidence-based practice, we need an amalgamation of these things. The part of this that I'm going to focus on is around research. <clears throat> now, most people that will be healthcare practitioners, we whatever um, field of practice that is, or uh, whatever um, <clears throat> discipline that is, will have some understanding of research. So really, as a, a, as a reminder of what research is, it's this this process of an inquiry is systematic. What do we mean by it's systematic? It follows the research process. So I've not cited the research process within here, but just as a, a reminder of what the research process is, it's a systematic approach um, to um, investigating um, a problem um, and asking a research question, um, reviewing literature, because that's really important that we review literature in the context of, of, of what, we're, what we're asking, um, then designing a study. And we'll talk about study design, because um, we're going to talk about case studies, um, and I suppose um, that reflects within there, that collection of data, um, and then how we analyse it and then present it. So we often talk about dissemination of data. So that's what research is. Now, I've given three quotes here. Um, some of you will be familiar with them from sort of pre-registration um, education, um, but I think it gives a nice balanced view of what research is, and there's something there for everyone to understand, depending on, on, on what way you think. <clears throat> so we've talked about this research, and we're kind of maybe flipping backwards a little bit here where we're talking about we talked about the research process <clears throat> but um that end that disseminated um piece of research that we've got will then be um graded um within a hierarchy um and the levels of evidence so this um Hierarchy, this hierarchy sits within this pyramid um, and it's a simplified version and I often use this because it's quite easy to understand that it has five levels. At the top of this um, is level one evidence that's randomised controlled trials um, and your, your um, systematic reviews. So they're the highest level of evidence. We talk about them being high level evidence because they've got the least bias, they're transferable, and they're generally generalizable to a large population. And we'll understand why that is in a minute. However, as we go down the levels of evidence, you'll see um, that things such as case series, case studies, expert opinion are much lower down. But what I'd like to emphasize is that by the end of this talk, that they're no less important um, than any of the other evidence. We still need it within the context of our practice and what we do as healthcare practitioners. Um, the, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guideline Network actually produce a more detailed version of this. Um, and I quite like it. It's not sat in a pyramid anymore. Um, they just explain it and they have a little key so that you can see within their, the, within their best practice guidelines what level each bit of evidence is that they cite. However, ignore that for a second, but I like the way that actually it breaks it up a little bit more. It pushes up these um, non-analytical studies, case studies reports, and gives them some credit up there at number three, which I really like, because actually we're really seeing the value of them. So just as a reminder, we do have two main research approaches. You'll be probably familiar with these, and that's quantitative and qualitative. 
quantitative, where we're looking much more at scientific data, often concerned with numbers, numerical data, and um, it's often analysed through computer statistics packages. Um, it's deductive as it, in its nature as it moves from what is known in the literature um, and it tests applicability in other situations. Um, there's a we minimise variation, so we try and keep all the variables the same apart from maybe one or minimise them. And um, we can generalise it in that it's probably applicable to a large population with similar char characteristics um, to those that are within the study. Um, qualitative on the other side is much more subjective. We are looking much more at descriptive elements here. Um, we are gaining an understanding of a phenomena of something that's going on. We interpret what's going on. So we maybe analyse interviews, we uh, possibly um, analyse um, transcripts of interviews or focus groups, just to give some example, um, case studies, etc. Um, and we interpret that using themes, for example. These are just examples. There's lots of ways depending on methods used. Um, however, we interpret these and we try to um, draw themes from that phenomenon. They do report a rich narrative. That's a real thing that, that I will demonstrate in a second. And it's really focused around the participants generally. And they're not always patients. Bear in mind that they can be uh, clinicians. They can be a whole range of different people. And then bringing these together, don't forget, and it's out with the scope of this talk, we also have mixed methods where you use both approaches or a combination of approaches um, and combine them together um, to make um, good quality studies as well. So that's an overview of the two main approaches. Do we know about these approaches? And hopefully you're already thinking, um, in your context, so within wound care, can I always use level one evidence? But in short, the answer is no. So I'm going to give you an example from my practice. Um, I recently conducted a study um, understanding student nurses' perceptions of caring um, for patients in clinical practice. Now, the word perceptions maybe gives it away here. Not every student will have experience of this. So I had to study perceptions. And for yourselves, that might that might even be relevant to yourselves. So how does this fit into the, the, the previous slide? Well, quite automatic, you probably um, are starting to think it is going to have to be qualitative um, data. Quantitative data probably here isn't going to give me very much. I can ask, do you have experience? Yes or no. Um, did you feel confident? And maybe put it on a scale. But actually, that's maybe as far as that goes for this study. What I want here is this rich narrative. So what I've provided here are some verbatim quotes from my study. I'm not going to read them all individually, but if you do have a little read of them on your own, what you'll see is that there's some real food for thought there. Um, and as, as a researcher, um, I kept my um, data collection around um, around um, interviews that were semi-structured. I didn't have a rigid structure. It was quite free-flowing. I could um, ask a question um, and then take it wherever that participant was going with that information they were giving me. That gave that rich narrative of data and actually I found things that I hadn't thought of and that's really good um, and, and qualitative research. And this is about exploring real life. So going back to the topic um, of this webinar about exploring real life here, so real life research and real life um, stories that can really fit into our research, or not fit into our research, but actually can give rich um, research findings. Let's think about this in relation to wound care. <clears throat> Within wound care, um, I'm no expert in wound care. I will hold my hands up. However, from having discussions, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very aware that actually it's very difficult to minimise variables um, among your patient groups. I'm pretty sure, especially the range of wounds that there are and the context of where people are at the time when, when they have these wounds, the history, all these different things are variables that are really, really difficult for you to control. Um, and so therefore that makes randomized controlled trials very, very difficult. Sample size, 
randomized controlled trials. So um, for quantitative data, um, you need massive sample sizes or very large sample sizes. For qualitative, and um, the example of my study, my sample size is only six or seven, and that's completely fine for a study of that size. And you can actually have smaller depending. Um, if anyone's um, looking into that, uh, Brown and Clark um, have a, a textbook and um, about qualitative research and actually has a nice table on sample sizes and illustrates that um, to you. The other thing is cost implications. To do randomised controlled trials, um, it's time consuming, it takes a lot of work, um, there's massive um, cost implications. And then on top of that, you've got an evolving market of products available. That scientific development within wound care um, is, is taking leaps and bounds. And so therefore, both of these things, by the time you get this randomised control trial going, it might be that the products that are available um, are, have improved no end and, um, and making that not possible. Something that you will note is that best practice statements um, are available and they will have randomised control trials, but they're not specific to any product. Um, it's generally around uh, leg ulcer healing, et cetera, for, 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 various, um, for various other um, reasons that they'll have done um, randomised controls as opposed to um, doing um, an, an actual product. So where do case studies, studies fit into this? Now, if some of you read some of the textbooks, there is a little bit of controversy around case studies and there are a number of other um, qualitative study designs. Um, so for example, within education, we use a thing called action research. Um, and again, sample sizes are small, it's lived research, it's day-to-day -day research within the lived world, um, and it really feeds into and improves our practice as it can for you um, with case studies. So case studies is a used methodology, and case study methodology does exist and is documented within the texts. It usually focuses around individual patients, a person, so I'm saying person because not always patients, remember, uh, groups of people uh, or cohorts of people with specific characteristics. That data collection can be through a variety of methods. It can be through um, clinician observation. Um, it can be through things such as, um, I suppose, focus groups, interviews with those individuals or them getting to write their narrative. And I'll talk about that at the end. It does provide a rich narrative. You do get an abundance of data um, and um, it does take a lot to decipher it and, and, and identify these themes. However, um, it's much easier uh, to explore complex issues that you can't explore um, with um, what would probably be a, a superficial um, exploration um, using more quantitative methods. It can influence future studies. They're often very good as initial studies or being exploratory in their nature um, and guiding further studies that are more specific to certain things. Um, I think, and if you read about them, patient narratives, as I've just mentioned um, there, um, is they can also be very useful within wound care. Um, I have cited an article here um, and it's around what is a case study. It's a very short article. It's a page and a half to two pages. And actually that's that's worth reading if you are interested in using um, case studies um, as part of research that you might do. Finally, not to forget quality improvement. Um, quality improvement um, isn't this, is not research. However, um, bear in mind that case studies or the research that you do from these can then feed into quality improvement projects and actually improve um, practice that we have. Um, quality improvement is much easier to do on a small day-to-day -day basis. Um, so bear in mind from your case studies that you collect, it might actually um, let you identify what change can we make here that will cause an improvement and take it through those cycles of improvement. So finally, here are some key references. There are a number of other um, references within there, but these are the key ones for the information rather than the diagrams, um, just to guide if you want to read any further. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for that talk, Chris. That was so interesting. And I think it's really linking on very nicely to our next speaker, who is Astrid Fermo. She's a bioscience engineer. She studied at the, Un at the University of Leuven in Belgium. I hope I said that right. She's got a master's degree in cellular and genetic engineering and has a passion for biology and medicine. She's worked at Flan Health for three and a half years, where she is a part of their medical affairs team. Over to you, Astrid. 
Thank you for the kind introduction, Catherine. Um, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all well and I've been enjoying our first speaker. I have. Um, my name is Astrid Fremo and I'm part of the Medical Affairs Department at Flan Health. Now, in what follows, I'm going to guide you through the results of a large-scale clinical evaluation of our product, Flaminol. These results build further on data that we obtained and published in 2018. Now, time flies. Um, being already five years later, we thought it's about time we provide you all with an update. So this clinical evaluation of Flaminol follows on from the Jones and Oates publication of 2018, which included 356 patients. Now in this updated evaluation, no more than 1,657 patients were included who all applied Flaminol for the treatment of their wounds. Now, being applied with so many patients, we wanted to know about the performance of Flaminol, about its clinical effectiveness. To do this, we used the wound assessment framework TIME, um, which is the most commonly used wound assessment tool in Europe, which you will know. Um, TIME has an, has an acronym standing for tissue, infection, moisture, and edges, is a clinical decision support tool, which provides a structured approach to wound bed preparation. This publication is an example of real-world evidence that can be utilized to support evidence-based practice. Um, it also includes uh, some nice case studies, which uh, Catherine will move on to uh, in the next session. Um, and yeah, real-world evidence that was um, very nicely discussed by Chris um, in the first presentation of this evening. Now let's have a look at the two key objectives of this clinical evaluation. So first of all, we wanted to emphasize the importance of accurate wound assessment using the framework time. And secondly, we aim to evaluate the continuous performance, um, the, the continuous clinical effectiveness of Flaminol in wound management. How did we do this? Um, well, we asked our UK district nurses to complete one evaluation form per patient to document the performance of Flaminol. This specific product evaluation was performed in the UK between February 2019 and November 2020. The questions on the form all related to the time framework and following the collection of all evaluation forms, the data was analyzed uh, and the analysis included a statistical analysis uh, using a standard binomial test. Now let's have a look into the results of this large scale clinical evaluation. So as said, a total of 1,657 uh, product evaluations were collected, um, which related to a very wide range of wound types. A um, couple of examples here on the slides. Uh, so these wound types included some of the most commonly treated wounds um, in the wound community such as leg ulcers, pressure ulcers, and diabetic foot ulcers. About two-thirds of the patients use Flaminol 40, um, which is, as you know, indicated for uh, more highly exuding wounds, and that is thanks to its higher alginate concentration. Um, compared to Flaminol Hydro, here on the left, uh, the blue one, um, which is indicated for low to moderately exuding wounds, and was used um, in 31% of the patients. Now, the other 3% of the patients used both, uh, so both Flaminol Hydro as well as Flaminol Forte over the course of the wound treatment. Following the time framework, the first step is evaluating and managing the tissue. Um, more specifically, the removal of fibrinous slough of necrotic tissue, um, and here we saw that no more than 81% of the district nurses um, reported an improved wound bed upon using Flaminol. Um, that result was also statistically significant. Another aspect when managing tissue uh, in wound care is evaluating healthy granulation tissue or tissue that is bright red, um, moist and granular in appearance. 
Um, over the course of the treatment, it was seen that 77.5% of the district nurses indicated an improvement in granulation tissue when using flaminol. Also here, the result was uh, statistically significant. From the T of time, we move on to the I, uh, standing for infection. It was noted that upon using flaminol, almost 73% of the clinicians reported an improvement in infection signs. Now, in this case, it's good to mention that when no infection um, signs were present at the start of the wound treatment with flaminol, also the answer op option, no change, um, indicated here on the slide in yellow, um, is an important outcome, demonstrating the ability of flaminol to prevent the wound from getting infected. When we then questioned the moisture management by flaminol, we saw that no more than 82.6% of the district nurses indicated that the moisture was well managed using flaminol. Now, given that approximately two thirds um, of the treated wounds in this evaluation had moderate to high exudate levels. Well, yeah, this, this outcome um, for flaminol was, was critical. And then last but not least, um, the wound edges and the surrounding skin. Um, almost 70% of the district nurses indicated that the condition of the wound edges and surrounding skin had improved with the application of flaminol. Also, this result was statistically significant. Um, um, and here, again, when the wound edges and surrounding skin were healthy at the start of the wound treatment, the answer option, no change here in yellow, um, is a good result as you aim for or you want to maintain such healthy wound edges over the course of the treatment. Three points of discussion still uh, before it's time to conclude this presentation. First, a structured wound assessment is required at the initial patient contact um, with a documented holistic framework, including photographs, including measurements. As mentioned, um, this product evaluation and the data obtained with it build further onto the Jones and Oates publication of 2018. Um, the results strengthen the outcome of 2018 publication and highlight the ongoing performance of Flaminol um, in addressing every aspect of the time framework. Then, thirdly, the questions asked in the evaluation all reflect an important factor in managing the barriers to healing, and the results shown are significant to relate to real-world practice, um, as well as to the need for a suitable and cost-effective uh, dressing regime. To conclude then, sandwiching dressings or, or using multiple dressings to tackle the different aspects of wound care can cause, as you all know, complications in practice and will result in increased costs. Um, that is why addressing um, that on its own can address the many barriers of wound healing um, will undoubtedly benefit the patient, the healthcare professional, as well as the NHS um, in terms of cost effectiveness, in terms of ease of use. This large scale clinical evaluation is um, as said, an example of real world uh, evidence. It shows that flaminol's versatile characteristics allow it to be used throughout the wound healing continuum as it promotes autolytic debridement. Flaminol offers antimicrobial protection. It keeps the wound moist while offering absorption of excess exudate. And last but not least, it protects the wound edges of the wound. Um, one last thing which I would like to mention is that we as a company, we keep on monitoring the performance and the safety of Flaminol and our other wound and skincare products on a continuous basis. Um, if you feel you would like to contribute or if you have specific suggestions or questions for us uh, relating to your use of Flaminol, then please reach out. Um, 
um, contact us, contact your local sales representative and let us know what you would like to discuss with us. Um, because having such discussions with you, well, that is our guide moving forward. And with that, my time's up. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the session and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Astrid. That was really interesting and it flowed on so nicely from Chris's presentation. So, well, I'm Catherine Rowland and I am a tissue fibrillity nurse specialist in NHS Lothian, which you may know better as Edinburgh uh, in Bonnie, Scotland. I've been a tissue viability nurse now for just over five years and I cover um, community and acute and I'm very passionate about pressure ulcers but really I just love all wounds. Um, thank you so much to Flaminol for having me on today to host and also to talk about my case study. So I'm sure either you've read or you're just about to read the Wounds UK article and what I'm doing today is I'm just going to explore in a little bit more detail one of the case studies that you will read about in that paper. And here it is there. So the case study, our gentleman is 59 years old. He's got COPD, psoriasis. He's quite a heavy smoker. But despite this, before being coming on well, he was pretty well. Um, he drove a school bus five days a week and had a good quality of life. He was brought into the acute hospital on the 5th of January with a pneumonia um, and renal failure. As well as that, he had this new erythematous rash, which you can see um, there. And um, a lot of the medical staff and nursing staff um, were concerned about how rapidly this rash appeared and was spreading. We didn't initially know what it was. Two days later, as you can see, the rash returned blistering and um, it was incredibly painful and sensitive for him. And he was diagnosed as having a cutaneous vasculitis. This then developed and by the 11th of February, the blistering had stopped, but it had left behind this deep necrotic damage. The pneumonia was resolved. However, the renal failure persisted and he was transferred to another hospital for ongoing renal input and um, dialysis. So I lost touch with him at this point from the acute. I then picked him back up in my community role on the 12th of March, and this is what we had. When we look at our times wound bed assessment here, we had 60% slough, we had 10% necrotic tissue, and we had 30% granulation. There were no signs of infection, but obviously there was a high concern that this could become infected. You can see there our, temp our measurements were 21.5 by six centimeters. What was the treatment plan? So the aim here, because of the size of the wound and where it was and um, the fact that it was really impacting his life, he was off work, he didn't feel he could go out of the house, um, we really wanted um, speed. And what we wanted was to remove the divitalite tissue, remove that necrosis and allow application of negative pressure wound therapy. In our case, it was the VAC therapy. And in order to apply that, you want 25% slough or less on your wound bed. So what we did was we applied flaminal hydro with an adhesive silicone foam on the top, and that was changed every three days. We chose flaminal because it removes debris, it promotes most wound healing environment, um, it protects against infection, and it's really conformable and easy to use. It worked really effectively and within 10 days on the 22nd of March, although the size of the wound was pretty much the same, we had a lot less slough and we were able to commence negative pressure wound therapy. That went for eight weeks. And this is how it looked afterward. The Times Wound Bed Assessment now, we have only 10% slough, 70% granulation and 20% epithelialization. There was no signs of infection. There was still minimal exudate, but there was more exudate than there had been pre-starting back therapy. Our aims now are to promote moist wound healing and encourage the continued healing of this wound, which although smaller was still sizable and it was still impacting his life. What we really wanted to do 
was he wanted to get to a stage where he had less trips because he was going every three days to the treatment room. We wanted less trips to the treatment room. We wanted him to get back to his job. We wanted him to be involved in self-care. He felt like he had a really positive experience with flaminol from the first time with its rapid removal of the necrotic tissue. And when we suggested trying flaminol forte, the same name, the same tube, but a different color, he was really happy to get on board with that. And he was able to reach the wound himself and apply that. We got him fit, Dopplered, fitted up and measured for compression hosiery. And we got to a situation where he was able to change the dressing himself. And he was only going in to see the treatment room nurse once a week um, so that she could kind of have oversight, double check he was all he was doing fine and um, redress that for him. So that continued. He was every three days. He had flannel forte, adhesive silicone foam and his compression hosiery. And this was him by the 31st of August, five centimetres by 2.5 centimetres. We were all really, really pleased with that. And if you have a look back, that's how far we came. Um, he was back to working and he's um, minimal dressings, minimum impact to his life. And he said himself, he really didn't expect it to heal. Um, so we were all yeah, really, really pleased with the progress that we made with what were two pretty simple wound plans, really. So yeah, what was the outcome for him? Back to work, self-caring, in the treatment room once a week. His hosiery um, was re reviewed every six months, um, and but as we know, a, um, leg ulcers are very common at reoccurring, and this is a lifelong commitment to compression hosiery, to compression garments, and um, to making sure that the wound doesn't um, break down again in the future. The study by Guess 2020, which well-known study showed that on average patients can receive up to eight different dressing types in a one-year period. This isn't necessary. Flaminol is really versatile and in this situation we were able to change from the hydro preparation to the forte preparation but fundamentally flaminol gel, silicone foam and compression and the patient felt happy with that. He felt like he trusted flaminol and he believed in it from the first time he had it and also he felt it was easy enough to apply and he felt secure using it. We don't need to keep changing dressings when you've got big complex wounds. One dressing that's versatile will follow you right through um, your wound care journey for weeks and months. So the positive patient's experience that he'd had initially influenced dressing selection, but also the fact that we don't need to be overcomplicating our wound care plans. We don't need to be making sandwiches. We don't need to be changing things for the sake of changing things. If it's not broke, don't fix it. And that's definitely what we found in this case study. Thank you so much for listening and um, thank you for joining us on this webinar. I hope you've been popping questions in the box as we've been going along and I look forward to rejoining the other two and answering them for you. Hello everyone. So I'm hoping um, I've seen a couple questions have popped in, but please do keep asking questions as we go along and we will try and just answer as many as we can. Um, so don't be shy and pop them in the box, okay? Now, I, the first one is for Astrid. Astrid, you've been showing us all of these nice results with significant outcomes, but what does it mean or imply when you say statistically significant? Thanks, Catherine. That's that's a good question indeed. Um, so in this case, the, the statistical test that was performed is a, a standard binomial test. And for such a test, um, a significant value would imply that the result or, or the outcome um, is higher than, than compared to the frequency expected by chance. Um, for example, um, for the eye of times, the, the improvement in infection signs was greater than would have been expected by chance. I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I know, because that's one of those ones that you could actually 
talk about for an hour in itself. I'm sure you all agree, Chris. Um, <laughs> so we um, actually now are on to Chris. Um, we're looking for an example of any research studies that you have used case studies as a methodology. Okay, so um, not personal research. However, there's actually a good example at the moment. Um, it is a Portuguese article, um, but I picked I picked that out because um, they actually explain in really nice terms the methodology in relation to case study. And um, there's a really nice explanation. And if you go on to your university or your workplaces. Um, search system for their library um, or um, one of the, the databases and put in community health and public health nurses case study in times of COVID-19. Um, so community health and public health nurses case study in times of COVID-19. It's actually an interesting article um, and some nice findings in it. However, it really explains the use of case studies within that. One that relates to my um, area of practice um, around education um, is nursing and referee students' perspectives of using digital systems on placement. And it's a qualitative study, um, which you'll all be familiar with from the presentation. Um, so, yeah, with that one, again, it's the use of case studies, but a different perspective. Now, there's an abundance of, of um um, studies out there um, and you'll find that when you um, search it will say case control study but actually what you're looking for it to be is just case study um, and some really interesting studies out there that you can actually if you start by looking at these studies it'll give you an idea of case studies as a methodology and then you can look at it in the perspective of your own area of practice so thank you for that question that's a really good question um, yeah thank you that was a great explanation. Um, there's one more for you. Okay. Um, we just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on how you would use a patient experience to help your decision making. Yeah, a really good question, actually. Um, so a number of aspects to this question. Uh, firstly, um, it might guide the evidence you, you use for your practice. So it might be that you go and look at current guidelines, etc., to lay evidence and look at that patient experience and the care or the intervention, etc., that you provide. It might actually also influence future research. So you might decide to get involved in actual empirical research, get ethical approval, follow the research process and actually conduct some empirical research. So for some people that are maybe going on to do master studies or anything like that, it might be that you do that for your dissertation or separate as something you do in your workplace. It might guide professional discussions within your workplace and then influence patient care um, through that. Um, also discussions with organisations such as um, as Fine Healthcare. Um, and actually in those discussions, um, when you're looking for um, evidence and for education, it might actually influence um, the, the, the education and research that they do um, from your experiences um, and your case studies that you find from patients. You might also create a number of case studies um, and the evidence that you create um, so, you might create local clinical guidelines, policies, etc. So there's a whole abundance of things there um, in relation to that question. So thanks for both those questions, really good questions so far. Well, there's one for me now, um, and it's actually it's a good question because um, so uh, quite a few people have popped in late on um, and maybe missed the beginning. And it's just to say to anyone that did pop in late, all of this has been recorded. Everyone who's watched it or signed up will be getting a link and you can watch the whole thing back. And I know I will be watching it back to remind myself about some of the things that Chris <laughs> has said, because I think it's going to be really useful for me. Um, uh, so it's something that I'm pleased I can watch back. So you can all watch it back. Um, uh, or if you missed it and you just come in, you can watch it back as well. Um, and the question was, is it a venous ulcer um, in the case study? And it was a, an ulcer. Um, caused by a vasculitis um, but um, you know any wound it is a leg ulcer because it was present for more than two weeks um, on the lower leg so it's a leg ulcer and um, it, the patient had you know mild venous insufficiency so technically I suppose you could say it was a venous leg ulcer um, but yeah it was slightly atypical in its presentation. Next we've got um, one for Astrid um, by a rosemary. Uh, can you use flaminol in a cavity where the whole wound bed cannot be seen, i.e. an abscess 
post incision and drainage where tracking cannot be ruled out? That's a tricky one. Huh? Um, um, thank you, first of all, for the question. It's a really good one. Um, it's a li little bit tricky. Why so? Um, well, in an ideal situation, we would say don't use a product because um, when we can't track down um, like the, the, the full depth of this cavity, um, the danger exists that that when you apply any sorts of products and the patient would react to it, well, how to get it out? And at that point, you need to get yeah, rinse, rinse out the cavity completely, get out the product um, like completely. And in such deep cavity wounds, it's, it can be very hard to get the product out fully. So it's a tricky one. Um, again, in an ideal situation, we say better not to, just from a patient safety perspective, um, because we know um, every patient can react to any sorts of, um, of ingredients. So um, we need to be careful there. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, uh, Catherine, maybe to add on to this, um, have you used flaminol in, in deep cavity wounds also? Myself, personally, I, I use it a lot. I do use it in a lot of cavity wounds. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would use it in one where, tra like, if there's tracking or any risk mm -hmm. of fistulation or anything. Yeah, but sort exactly. of, you know, your cavity, your it's more sort of like your sacral wounds and things, your sacral sores, where you know you can maybe feel bone at the bottom or whatever. Yeah. Um, those are the kinds of wounds exactly. that I would happily use flaminol on. And we've had some pretty bad incidences where packing has been lost or mm -hmm. not fully come out or broken mm -hmm. up. Um, and... Um, especially now in the acute where you've got issues with them um, some documentation's paper a lot of it's on the computer um sometimes we're not people aren't always keeping up to date a packing form you know the community's slightly better you know they'll yeah. four in four out but very often I'll, I'll go and see a patient with no how my idea how many went in so how many should be coming out so that's something I love flaminol for I feel it you don't need to be take you know it doesn't need to come out you don't need to be counting the amount that's going in and out um so it's something that I, I go to uh, uh, over your standard packing that I would have used to use. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, and another one for me, since I'm, I'm on a roll, um, <laughs> and it's how do you approach self or shared care with patients or family? Sometimes they, they can be hesitant. Have I got any advice? Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's not one for everyone at all. Um, I think it's about knowing your patient, having a relationship with your patient. Um, and understanding what they want from something. Um, I think that there, especially COVID, you know, there was a there was a feeling in COVID, I know as I was in the community, some some isolated people, the only visits they got, the only people they saw were their district nurses. So if you were then trying to make them look after themselves and reduce those visits, they really felt that on a, on a you know, emotional level. It just wasn't going to be right for them. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where self-care just, I, I don't think, would be appropriate. Um, however, you know, it, it, when you when you get to know someone, when you build up a relationship, you can understand he wants to get back to work. What are his goals? And it's about understanding and let them understanding that you're not trying to pan them off because you're busy, but that actually you're trying to empower them and fit in with their lives and what they need. Um, and, and to be honest, often self-care, yeah, it's getting the family involved. There's a lot of family members who can't do much physically for a disabled relative, but they could do a dressing change. They could be empowered, actually. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just about getting to know the patient and um, and finding out their priorities. Absolutely. Um, Astrid, what is mm -hmm. the difference between the different coloured tubes of flaminol? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. So we have indeed two colors. We have the, the blue one, that is the flaminol hydro, uh, and we have the yellow one, that is the flaminol forte. Um, now, there is actually one single difference between both, and that is the amount of alginate inside the flaminol. Now, the alginate is responsible for absorption, absorption of excess moist inside the flaminol structure. Um, with the blue one, there is 3.5% of alginate inside, um, meaning that it is indicated for um, uh, slightly to moderately exuding wounds. 
Whereas in the yellow one, the flamina 40, there is more alginate, 5.5% uh, to be precise. Um, so a higher alginate content implies like more um, capability, let's say, to absorb. So we, uh, we um, indicate that uh, flaminal, so flaminal forte, the yellow one, for moderately to highly exuding wounds. That is the, the only difference, like the other uh, aspects inside flaminal, the antimicrobial uh, ingredients and so on. Um, those are all similar between both. Mm. Yeah, and I'll put, add my bit in here that the, the amount of people um, that understandably think that flaminal hydro is a hydrogel <laughs> it's, just, it's something that, you know, um, I, we see a lot of um, because it's blue, because it says hydro and they think it's a hydrogel um, mm. and it's not a hydrogel. It's not doing donating that moisture like a hydrogel would. Um, and uh, that is something that if anyone's watching, they didn't know that or they get muddled with it. I could see Chris. I reckon Chris thought that, didn't you? <laughs> um, but yeah, the hydro it's is not wearing. a hydrogel. Um, <laughs> So, yeah. Thanks for oh, that bit, got, Catherine. Got another one popped in. This is okay. great, guys. Keep them going. We've got nine <laughs> more minutes. Uh, can Astrid, this is for you mm -hmm. again. Can flaminal be used without a dressing? For example, can it be applied thinly and daily to an area on the head or neck following a failed skin graft when a secondary dressing can't be applied? Or is a secondary dressing always needed? Yeah, again, a little bit tricky. Yeah? So um, in theory, we would say, please try to apply secondary dressing on top of flaminol. Why so? Because like in a couple of hours, the flaminol will dry out. That is because the alginates inside the flaminol, uh, the, the compound um, responsible for absorption. But that's in theory. We know in practice, it's <laughs> um, it can change. Absolutely. So um, if you feel... Uh, it works without, uh, I know in some cases it's really hard to, to um, cover the flaminol. Um, um, then, then you can keep it open. But then I would really advise to apply a thick layer and apply it. Yeah, you need to renew it very often. So, but in theory, we would say please try to cover. Yeah. I must Again, say I've used yeah. it without a secondary and just regular application yeah. because well, sometimes there is just no other way and exactly. something is better than nothing. Um, so absolutely. I must say I, I have done that. Yeah, um, makes sense, Catherine. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I've got to say, I do that on my toddler quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, sorry, I missed the one before that related to our um, tunneling one. Um, and it's just how are you um, applying flaminol in a cavity? Do you do it from a tube? Mm. I wouldn't advise doing it from the tube. I would uh, use like a nozzle. Um, the other thing that we we can um, or our sales reps can easily bring to you, um, like this, this yeah, a nozzle thing that you can apply onto it. And with the nozzle, you can easily um, apply it in, in cavity wounds. Or you can use a syringe, for example. Um, might work too. Um, um, just like put yeah, out I'm the flaminol the syringe. in the syringe and voila, and then you can use a syringe easily, I think. Um, in some cases, but that is more like not really for the cavity wounds, but more the how to say it, lab wounds. Um, they would apply flaminol first onto the secondary dressing and then apply it all together, um, uh, onto the wound. Um, but again, there, make sure that flaminol is your um, primary wound contact layer. Um, that's really important. I know in, in burn wound care or like wounds that can be really painful, that is um, uh, a trick that, that works really well to manage pain also now. Yeah. Lovely. Well, there is nothing else that's come in, and I think we've probably covered most things i think we've had a really interesting insight into evidence and research from you chris really good questions on that and we've had some great great questions on how we're using flaminol how not to use it um and then the realities of it, i suppose um so i don't know if either of you have anything else you wanted to add or thank you very much for listening absolutely yeah. i agree yeah 
been an absolute pleasure um and we've learned i've learned, i've learned a lot so i'm hoping you guys all have like i said you'll get emailed your certificate um for attendance at the end of this to the email that you registered with you'll be able to watch it back and um you will be able to share with anybody if you want to share the information that you've seen today your local flaminal rep will also be able to help you if you have any other questions and um thank you very much for attending thanks for helping and coming on chris and astrid thank you catherine mm -hmm. and thank you for watching everyone bye bye, bye, take bye. Care.